कभी करती है मुलाकातें कभी करती है मुलाकातें कभी यादों में बरसाते किताबें करती है बातें किताबें करती है बातें मन की गहरी झील में कूद जाती हैं कभी सोच के दरिया के संग संग बहती जाती हैं कभी चाहे शाम हो या हो रातें किताबें करती हैं बातें हेलो वेलकम टू किताब नामा आई एम हियर विद अनन्या बैनर्जी ऑथर ऑफ द किटी पार्टी सन्यासिन Ananya welcome and uh, I believe you're a media consultant here at Doordarshan yourself that's right is it weird for you to be uh, on a show instead of behind the camera yeah considering that i have been behind uh, the scenes uh, i i'm more comfortable on the production control <laughs> panel <laughs> than here but um, okay it's it's a new uh, something new is always good i can understand this is your first book right my first novel yeah yes. i've written a number of short stories before that and what was calling to you to write this one i'm not exactly sure you know but who's basically it's the central character the chief protagonist who's alison jordan uh i'll who tell an you american american girl you want to talk a little bit about alison alison is actually um completely more or less you know uh, she came out of my head because of my, my friend janet lee she's an english woman and very charming and the looks and the and the, and the whole thing about alison alison's aura you might say is uh, this friend of mine and that's from there i used to see her a lot in the iic mm -hmm. and from there the story idea evolved and i was very interested in the uh, to see a sort of bunch of women sitting together you know having a ball i mean they were you know right, uh, right. having a ball but i would never like to like to have been a part of that but uh, they were enjoying themselves and i wondered mm. what it was all about i've never seen my friend janet in any of those uh, parties obviously mm -hmm. she uh, but uh, that's how it came about you so, wouldn't like to be a part of that what do you mean no i wouldn't like to be <laughs> a part of the kitty kitty party no and yet you've written about uh, yeah but remember uh, that um, uh, the kitty party sanyasins so it's a tang in cheek title let's tell people about the kitty party sanyasins what makes them different from any other kitty party no they are not different to start with they have their problems we all have our problems and i think to each one of us our own problems are the greatest mm -hmm. right my own problem it may be just an aching tooth but that's much more important to me than somebody's life coming apart right. because my tooth is aching so here it's a question of i thought maybe give them a uh, chance to look at each other's lives feel for each other a bit mm -hmm. not not just the kitty party members but feel for their children for their families maybe for their husbands much more than they normally do react much more mm -hmm. sensitively that was one part i mean that's not uh, really the principal thing i'll tell you the principal uh, idea of writing this was i'm very fond of the scriptures the you know uh, uh, vedas and puranas mahabharata mm -hmm. ramayana right. i love uh uh delving into those my mom used to force me to read <laughs> those things when i was in i had amarchitra katha when i was growing up which ah, was but uh, i i'm not i'm talking about the genuine <laughs> stuff that i had to read out to her from a, you know small print uh, but and uh, they are the stories are never ending and they are fascinating mm -hmm. but many people <clears throat> not only kids which i hope a lot of kids will read the book just out of curiosity but it's not just the gen x but it's also many people of my generation they they know somebody called narad or they know somebody called Gar garur ha ha naam to janta mm -hmm. but they don't really know what it's all about so i thought it would be nice to bring them into bring it, it up to this. speed yeah. um just so everyone's not confused it's mm -hmm. a book about loosely about four or five women who meet every month and they talk about their problems and through their problems and a spiritual allegory they they manage to solve it is that is that more or less correct <clears throat> more or less uh, i wouldn't say manage to solve it because you see uh, it's a novel and uh, a, a solution a problem doesn't find a solution at the end of the chapter but they find solace in these stories yeah and then they carry that forward that's the whole idea right. you know, if you get a good idea if something good happens 
if something uh, you, you, a story strikes ignites something in your mind mm -hmm. then you carry it forward right. and maybe you know share it with so many others you know with your kids with their friends and stuff and generally make life a little easier for everyone i was quite interested to see the person who <coughs> was doing the majority of the discussions was alison in fact yeah. uh, the youngest yeah. and the only foreigner <coughs> in the entire group yeah. why, why why did you give an outsider's eye to these yeah. uh, well, it's uh, stories, again as so I to told speak. you, Alison is uh, based on my friend, and I find it very easy to talk to my friend Janet. I find it easier than uh, maybe talking to friends I meet all the time, uh, a lot of the time. I mean, because based, I've I've tried to make Alison the kind of person that she's different. She's she is a foreigner in the sense she's an American. Mm -hmm. But she could be anything. I mean, she she's an Indophile, so she knows more about India than many of uh, the kitty uh, other <laughs> members do. That's true. Maybe maybe sometimes you need to be an outsider to do some some yeah. research yeah. because there's there's another foreigner, well, of Indian origin, who <coughs> shows up at one of the meetings hmm. and she begins to challenge Alison and she she says, you know, what about this? What about that? Hmm. When she's talking about the whole Kunti Karna thing, right. she says, you know, Kunti just abandoned him and then. Yeah. Uh, he lost his teacher later and stuff like that. Yeah. What made you uh, challenge, take them head on like that? Yeah, uh, you see, Ying is, uh, she pretends to be Chinese, but she's actually from Indian parents, okay? So, th not that that has much relevance, mm -hmm. except as a dramatic kind of thing in the story, in the whole plot of the novel. But, uh, you know, Alison gives a good picture. And sometimes I was feeling that some way it might just be a little bit boring. Mm -hmm. If you saw everything is good and mm -hmm. everything comes, so here she challenges things outright, outright, you know, and she says, uh, "No, you're saying this Kunti is a wonderful woman, and you know she's the mother of the uh, Pandavas, but what about Karan? And I want to, uh, I, you know, so these are challenges she throws. And uh, at that point, I've even said in the book that <coughs> one of the other members feel that while Alison is a wonderful storyteller." Uh, Ying is much better at hands-on, you know, debate. That's true, but you, as the, as the author, have also said that Ying likes to throw tantrums. Yeah. Saying perhaps maybe it wasn't your intention, but it felt a bit like you were dismissing her for oh, her no. challenging. Don't we all love to throw <laughs> tantrum? I, I, I mean, I, I, don't you? I, I mean, yeah. I'm not admitting that on camera. Uh -huh. No, but I'm admitting it on camera. Yes, I like to throw tantrums when I feel it the moment calls for it. So, I no, no, I'm not being dismissive at all. Because uh, Ying is actually a very brave, brave girl. So, how many years did it take to put this together? About four years. And it was always your intention to, uh, to have a novel where myths were accessible? Yeah, yes. Can you tell me yes. a bit about the process? Yeah, uh, because, uh, you know, I used to tell, again, I, I, I'm getting a bit boring or repetitive. I'm coming back mm -hmm. to my friend. I used to tell her and she tell, she said, tell me more. She sounds like a very lovely person. She is. Janet. She, beautiful to behold and beautiful <laughs> from within. And she said, tell me more. Tell me another story. Yeah, tell me a thing. And then, you know, I, I'm, I, I love telling stories anyway. That's how the thing uh, came about. And then I thought, why not make it a little more relevant? Mm -hmm. Here's a, uh, say one of the people he, with a problem. It's a very so-called modern problem, but more problems are not really modern or ancient, right. you know, just as a uh, thing. So therefore, uh, when the problem is uh, not resolved exactly, but at least a solution is given mm -hmm. through a story in the Mahabharata. I, I thought that would be a very novel how, idea. How did you pick the stories themselves? Uh, I have to tell you this actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it started as a linear narrative and somewhere around chapter 3 or 4 it started getting non-linear and I was quite enjoying writing mm -hmm. in that. I, and I took it t till the end in a very non-linear fashion. And uh, as I was writing, the things that came to my mind, uh, Mira, one of the characters, she's a TV presenter, very beautiful and very full of herself, you know, that, you know, I do this and this and nobody understands me, you know, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, Alison tells her the story of Narad, who also th is full of himself. <laughs> and he says, you know, I am, I live, every breath I take is in praise of that the Lord. That is true. I mean, if Alison was my friend, I would be a little bit irritated <laughs> by that. I'm like, what do you have to tell, tell me about my life? <laughs> That's why I thought that a character like Ying, who challenges Alison, would be interesting. Right. Hmm. And so you built up this multi-narrator multi plot. Yes. Uh, initially, I must tell you that uh, 
each woman was supposed to tell a story on her own. Mm -hmm. But then I thought, I am one person and when I'm writing it, possibly the same style would come into all the stories and right. that looked very odd. So I worked it out into that the women go, the persons go and tell their stories to Alison. We, and one part it goes But like you can see it from different points of view as well, right? Oh yeah. As you're reading. Yeah, 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 sure. So you managed to put a bit of different perspectives into... Oh, uh, yeah, I've tried that all the time. Especially in the latter half of the book, when we are really talking about the youngsters. And you know, the, there's a lot of sordidness everywhere. But the important thing is to get, a, get over it. Get over it and get on with life. That's the whole idea. I found it very interesting how you were able to slip from an older voice to a younger voice. Mm -hmm. Was there, have you, uh, Do you know a lot of young people? Is um, Are you in touch with, with your 21-year-old self? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Do you, do you want to talk about that a bit? Uh, it's not with my 21-year-old self so much as actual 21-year-olds, you know, right. or teenagers actually. Right. And it's great fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to, just as it's very, very wonderful to be with really old people and then you enjoy yourself so much. Mm -hmm. You bring so much joy in their lives, you know, and they bring so much joy in yours because they're kind of happy if, if you go and visit and stuff like that. And similarly, when you're t talking uh, with things and you're I'm always trying to be like Ying, you know, mm -hmm. and score one over the mm -hmm. other, so I have fun. That's so a, lo a lot of your characters are from real life then? Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. I'm not admitting it because all the characters are completely fictitious. <laughs> of course, of course. But everyone says a first novel is a little bit autobiographical. No, no. All the characters are completely fictitious in quotes. <laughs> and I find that some of the things that happen to these women is quite scandalous. Like a husband has an affair with someone and someone else gets pregnant out of marriage. Well, not scandalous, oh. Oh. but uh, is that also stuff from your real life? I know people like that, yes. Uh, for instance, one of the cases is, uh, it's, it's, I think, one of the saddest stories there. I mean, the real life one, not from the myth. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, that a young girl, a young widow, I mean, you know, she, she actually has to face a um, trial, you know, uh, of, of, of um, a terrible trial from her in-laws because they, they claim uh, they're not bothered about her small children and they're not bothered. They bring a court case against her to claim her husband's mm -hmm. thing. These are first real life stories, which obviously I've uh, uh, turned around, but, uh, and then related also to uh, f this woman that I'm talking about. She, I, I wouldn't name them because then it gets boring. Um, read the book, <laughs> <laughs> um, is that uh, when she says that she was in total shock, it was, it, it was thing, and then she gets the legal notice from her mm -hmm. father-in-law, it's like a curse. But she finds the blessing within the curse because she finds the strength within herself then mm -hmm. to deal with the situation. Right. Similarly, I've related that, Alison relates that to Dasharath when he's cursed by the blind sage. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, they, when they're returning after, you know, after this terrible tragedy, uh, the Senapati says, uh, Maharaja, why do you look? There's a glint of happiness in your eyes. I can't understand it. And he says, look, he cursed me to die the same way as he did, grieving for my son. And I don't have a son. So that means I will have a son. <laughs> so w which one is your favorite story? I mean, have you put your favorite story in here for one and for two in the book, which mm. is your favorite story? Your favorite parable that is not mm -hmm. the real life story. Yeah, uh, I actually is Garur is my favorite <laughs> story, but if you uh, m uh, talk about the my favorite part of the book, of course it's Abhimanyu. You Why? know, uh, the whole thing about this uh, teenager, fourteen or fifteen years old, this warrior, this whole thing. Whenever I read it or whenever I think about it, I I actually know the story so well. I don't really need to. Um, what should I say? Not really need to see, uh, read it. it I found that a very sad me. bit of the Mahabharata where, course, when he dies. Of course, it, it, no, but the whole thing, you know, his destiny takes him. He is Arjun's son. That's destiny. He's a mighty warrior. That's destiny. He's Krishna's nephew. That's destiny. The way destiny rules, but in his life, and he stands up to it. I mean, he is one of the most gallant and glorious characters right. of Mahabharata and the way Arjun reacts when he hears about he can't believe that this son can die. But a lot of Hindu myths I find a lot to do with this is your karma it will happen to you because it was written in the stars how yeah. do you feel about that? No I don't agree with that at all. No? no? What you yes you do reap the benefit uh, 
what should I say, the points, you know, brownie points for your karma or not. I do think, I believe in that, that you should do good karma because mm. basically you have to account for it later. I believe in that. That's right. But I do not believe in destiny that, oh, I've done that, so there's nothing more I can do except wait for my ultimate end. No, trying, it, this is the whole thing about Ketipati Sanyasins, you know, try, let's do something about it. All the women are quite well off in, in mm. the book as well. Was that a deliberate choice? Yeah, at that point of time, yes. And no yeah. one is a housewife either. I don't think anyone in the, any characters no, are housewives. No. They all have proper yeah. jobs and Do stuff. House, yeah, no, no, no one is a housewife. I don't think so. It's no. a little lawyer, there's yeah. an anchor, yeah. there's a dancer, yeah. there's all these people. Yeah. You didn't want to explore maybe a lesser economic class? Not uh, at that point of time when I started the book. You know, a lot of my short stories are about totally different. I mean, I've written a lot of short stories on... Um, mm. uh, uh, that in, uh, you know, my, my first language is Nepali, so oh, right. I'm very okay. proud of that. You know, I'm very proud of that. We are four generations in uh, in Darjeeling, and um, a lot of my stories are about short stories. I mean, are about people there, and I love writing. And you don't them. have any Nepalis in this one? Um, no. <laughs> That's interesting. Mm. Uh, I like like I said before, a lot of first novels seems to come from some autobiographical. So see, I'm different. <laughs> <laughs> but the two things I did notice is the India International Centre. Huh. which is mentioned a lot, and T, which is also mentioned a lot. Yes. Well, India International Center, when I came into Delhi, you know, which moved into Delhi, which was uh, many years ago, uh, the first place I was ever taken out for a meal was India. I was very impressed, and it's, it's got a beautiful ambience. So, and then I found out when I was writing it in mm -hmm. my little laptop, then I s wrote most of it in the library. So therefore, maybe that's b become a kind of uh, recurrent theme. I don't know. And tea, of course, I was like born and brought up in tea, you know. So I don't think uh, my mom. There's a lot of like tea drinking happening yeah, in, yeah, in yeah, this whole yeah, book. Yeah. I also that, is that that part of my life is yes in, in reflected. <laughs> in <it. laughs> I also found what was quite interesting is that you had a naysayer. Leela, mm. who basically ah oh, foreigners in our country mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know every basically everything that happened she ha she seemed to have a problem with. Yeah. Was that another voice inside your head that you? No, were, it's not. Um, it's not nothing that I identify with myself because I I think I'm a very very positive person. That way I deal take on problems deal with them. But yes, uh, I know people like that who will find something to be discontent with in everything, anything good happening, oh, but my hair is coming off, you know, my I'm losing hair, you know, but you just got this kind of an award, oh, yeah, but you know, my husband is cheating on me, you know, uh, I suspect, you know, these are. She must people. have been fun to write though, for that hmm? reason. Hmm? It must have been fun to write yes. her though, <laughs> for that yes, reason. Yes, yes. Who is your favorite character to write, besides Alison? I know no, you love no, Alison. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I, I like the origin of the uh, uh, character. I like Sunidhi, the old lady who is oh. the psychiatrist. I right. Like Why? Uh, just because she's different. <laughs> Which one reminded you most of yourself? Sunidhi did. Oh, right. Okay. So, you, you decided to be the older one. Yeah. In, she's, in, she's, in the book. She's only 75 years young. <laughs> and um, you were saying earlier about you, how you decided to change from a linear narrative to all, yeah. over the, all over the place. Well, I was saying I didn't really decide. decide. It was... It happened, you know, when I was writing. Sometimes you don't uh, really, the prologue and the epilogue were kind of planned. The rest of it just happens. Yeah. Anything else you want to say about, about the book before we wrap up? No, uh, nothing really, except that it was, it took a lot writing it. Remembered my mom a lot when I finished it because she used to nag me to finish it. And right. I hope somewhere, wherever she is, she's not with me anymore, but wherever she is, I hope she, feels very happy when she reads it. I, I actually want to talk a little bit about this cover, um. which is uh, which is really um, quite exciting looking. Um, and this image, I believe, is yours. Uh, that That is my pet image, yeah. I think uh, <laughs> I always visualized, you know. What do, what do you think of when you see this? It's, 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 uh, w the, the, there's, there, there is a lot of earthiness in the book and there's spirituality. All right. All right. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for, for being here. And mm -hmm. uh, I had fun. And uh, kitty party sanyasins. Welcome to the book show Kitab Nama. We're here at the Jaipur Literary Festival with South African author Ivan Vladislavich. Um, and he's going to talk to us about his book, uh, The Lost Library, published by Seagull Press. So Ivan, can you tell us a little bit about your book, please? 
Well, the book came about as a result of my um, researches in my notebooks. I'm a great keeper of notebooks and uh, I return to them very frequently for ideas for fictions. Uh, some years ago I was trawling through my notebooks and I was struck by how many ideas there were that I had never written, how many unfinished ideas there were. And it occurred to me that there may be patterns in these incomplete fictions. And so I began to look for those patterns, for the connections between them. And out of this grew a book of essays. They're essentially essays about the different kinds of incomplete uh, stories I have. They're essays about loss. They're essays about the, the allure of the incomplete. And they're arranged around a central piece, which is in, called The Lost Library, the title story of the book. And that, in fact, is a complete fiction. And in that, that story is a kind of Borgesian library in which are kept all the books that have never been published. The book was published by Seagull, as you said. Um, in the, the original version was simply a text version. But the version published by Seagull was very beautifully illustrated by um, Sunandini Banerjee who does a lot of work for Seagull. She also produces their wonderful catalogues. And she produced a set of plates for the book, which uh, I find absolutely wonderful, very much in the spirit of the book. And she also produced the wonderful cover. So that's The Lost Library. And um, you have a, a novel, Double Negative, which is, uh, has recently been published in the UK. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, Double Negative also has quite an interesting uh, background, the way it was produced. It was written initially in response to um, a book of photographs by David Goldblatt, the South African documentary photographer. Uh, he's been taking pictures for 60 years. Uh, in the, about 2005 or 2006, he decided to produce a, a book of his Johannesburg photographs. He asked me to write something for uh, for that book. I didn't want to produce a critical essay and so I decided instead to write a fiction which then grew into double negative, a full-scale novel. We then had to decide how to publish those two projects together, a very unusual combination, a book of documentary photographs and a full-length novel. They were published um, as a double volume uh, um, by Contrasta in Italy in 2010 and then the, the photo book and the novel were separated and, and published on their own. My novel was published um, in the, U the UK and the US by And Other Stories and in South Africa by Muzi um, and yeah that's my, my most recent fiction. Right, so, so would you like to read from the Lost Library or Double Negative? Yes, yeah, so well I think seeing that we're in India and my publisher is here in India I'll read just a couple of uh, pages or so, a page perhaps from the Lost Library. And this is the, the opening section of, of the, the title story. She's pretty, this librarian, the young man thinks, sun-browned and outdoorsy, with none of the papery pallor he associates with the profession. Perhaps she goes water skiing or horse riding on the weekend. Or perhaps she has interests even more at odds with book tending, like fire eating or sword play. Her high heels are as sharp as nails. Not very sensible, he thinks. We don't need to be sensible here, she says. This way, please. He follows her down a corridor, his eyes on her supple calves, and they stop before a locked door. She takes a key from a pocket of her dust coat, pauses for effect, he supposes and unlocks the door. The room beyond is long and narrow. Parquet gleams underfoot as if winter sunlight is falling from high windows, although the walls are blank. Against the far wall is a glass-fronted cabinet. In the doorway, the librarian steps out of her heels into a large pair of sheepskin slippers and motions the young man to do the same. There are a dozen pairs moored like dinghies to the skirting board. He stoops to unlace his boots, but she tells him not to bother. And so he hunts for the largest pair of slippers and steps into them, boots and all. 
It is impossible to walk normally in the loose-fitting slippers. They have to shuffle in slow, gliding steps they cross to the cabinet. We like to start here, she says, because the idea is easy to grasp. She pauses so that he can take in the books behind the glass before she goes on with the cheery authority of a tour guide. These are the lost books, the ones that would have been written had their writers not died young, arranged alphabetically and classified by cause of death. A wave of her slender hand, accidental death, booze of course, disease, those old standbys, consumption and syphilis, and the new one, AIDS, a growing collection. Duels, little sign of growth there. Motor accidents, murder, suicide, a disproportionate number of Russians and Japanese, as you'd expect, and quite a few of your countrymen and women too. So this is, this is a, a fiction in the middle of a, a book of essays, essentially. Yes, that, that, that's a fiction and uh, it, it, it's a sort of centerpiece of the, of the collection and I suppose it's a kind of ironic touch right. because the book is really, it's called The Lost Library and Other Unfinished Stories, but the centerpiece of the book is a story that is very much finished. And um, it's also a way of holding together the essays which are quite diverse and quite fragmentary. So the essays in a sense are kind of annexes and the central room of the library, if you like, is a, com a complete fiction. Mm -hmm.